What's been the biggest change you've seen? In my lifetime? Since you were a kid. Mm, so many of them. But what really sticks is uh, the assassination and imprisonment of all my mentors, heroes. As I was a young man through the civil rights, witnessing that. And then still, we in uh, the racism and the discrimination, Jim Crow is still alive, it's just more sophisticated. You know, we became more humane because of the technology. And now I can say I witnessed the civil rights movement in the 60s when they first televised it. And I saw, like this brother, was going to vote. And law enforcement wouldn't let him vote. And they pushed him with the billy clubs and stuff back down the steps. And one fella came up behind him and kicked him. And uh, that visual never left my mind. And he was an older gentleman, and these were some young fellas, his counterparts, and the sheriff, and whoever the law enforcement was there, with them Billy Club pushing it along. He was a bad self, just trying to register to vote. And the sad part about it, when he got to the bottom of the stairs. These are white kids kicking a black man? In his ass. And uh, that visual, and he was just trying to vote. You know, and I was like 12, 11, 12 or something like that. And the first time I really experienced the disparities, disparities between the have and the have nots and the us and the them. My father used to deliver liquor on the north side of Chicago, late 50s, early 60s. And on Saturdays, I used to ride with him, Everson, Skokie, Highland Park. And, um, we was on 51st and Federal before the projects and the Dan Ryan. So it was considered shack town. And, and, and we used to hit, my mother used to have to heat water on the pot belly coal stove. We didn't have no inside plumbing. We had a toilet, but it was like an outhouse in the house because we had no pipes and this and that. But back to the North Shore, we had to go through the, you know, the re-entrance to deliver and the first time I went into a, one of the homes, I had to be like eight or nine years old. And that was the first time I saw the disparity between us and them. I didn't even know that type of stuff them people had in their house existed. We on a, a pot belly coast over the heat, number 10 round tub, them old number 10s to bathe in, and my mother and father had 16 of us. And uh, my oldest brother, thank God, he's 79. Good health, moving, handsome fellow, still good. Been with his wife over 40 years. His kids, grandkids, great-grandkids. It's good compared to where we started from. In fact, my whole family. But uh, he was the first boy and I was the second. But we had this six years apart. So while he was doing the paper routes, did, you know, asking people from Jewels and our school, you know, to carry groceries and this and that on Saturday. So I used to have to do the mopping and taking out the garbage and this and that. But as a kid, I saw the disparity. And I didn't understand why that they doing this and, and we can't pay a light bill. We don't have no gas or nothing. And that turned me. And uh, and watching what was they televising on TV and what I was reading, a black revolutionary soul brother was born. And ever since then, uh, I've been trying to find a way to even the scale, but I have more days behind me than in front of me. And uh, I don't know. You know, I'm not going to say it's hopeless because as long as we have breath in our body, we have hope. So I'm, I'm just, I'm just, I'm living on a hope for a change. Do you feel like things are getting better for the race issue than they were then? Yes, until we got to uh, the 21st century technology with the media and we get instant news. We get 
stuff that go viral. And uh, I still see the racism, privilege, and us, them, and uh, back in the 60s when they uh, signed the Civil Rights Movement. Supposed to do some to us. But then they say we had a civil rights, we could vote. But then in the 60s, they introduced the drugs, the black rotation movies, the Donald Gone books. And my generation was the generation that's supposed to take us to the next level. But we was influenced by what we've seen because we never seen a black man come out on top of a white man. So that was Jim Brown, our hero, and Superfly and all that. So they glorified the drugs, the pimp, the street life. And at the 10 age, we was impressive because we haven't been nowhere out the neighborhood. And we thinking that's the world. And then we see the pimp players, hustlers, and gangsters in the neighborhood. They styling and profiling. And then we look at our parents struggling. The scale. And we're very impressive. Just like this generation behind us, two, three, with the rap songs, that gangster rap, and bitch get my money and all this. And, and look at the, what they done done to our young brothers, where they think, well, when we was kids, like I said, in the 60s, we was influenced by the street life. But now that the world has opened up, and they still doing the same thing with this generation. They've been tricked. They've been bamboozled. And they, like us, their eyes was off the prize. And we wanted naturally what they had. And how we gonna get it? You can't go to the bank, you know? And now, like I said, the first time I ever seen a black man come out on top of a white man was on a movie. That was my hero. So instead of Martin Malcolm and Marcus, them our heroes, we took our eyes off the prize. And now super fly to Mac and all that stuff. Cause to us, they had money. And they was living a type of life that I seen on North Shore. And naturally I want some of that. And 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 but how? When this you know the deck is stuff to stacked against us. But, like with my education, I only went to the Chicago Board of Education to the, to the eighth grade. I got my eighth grade diploma in St. Charles Juvenile Facility. I got my GED in the county jail. I got into, introduced to college with Malcolm X because back in the 60s when I was 18, I started a GED program for the brothers and sisters that was street organization wise. And uh, that didn't last because they didn't want that. And when I, uh, when I was 22 years old, I was sentenced to 10 to 20 years in the penitentiary. And I didn't know at the time that I had that bull that was on my back because Chicago Defender at the time was a black orientated newspaper. And they had put me and Larry in the society column saying that we was the next up and coming black leaders. Larry Hoover. Hoover. Yeah. And uh, we, that was about when we was 19, 20. And by the time we was 22 years old, he had 200 years and I had 20. And I didn't know that that was designed. But I thank God that they didn't do us like they did Fred Hampton Sr., the chairman, how they assassinated him in his bed with his fiancee next to him pregnant with Fred Hampton Jr. And by the grace of God, they survived. But Fred did it. And I thank God because the way my generation, especially behind the Martin Luther King's riot in 69, if they would have did that to Larry or Jeff, and our generation of Chicago would have never been the same. You know, and we were trying to elevate ourselves from burn, baby, burn to learn, baby, learn. But sometimes violence becomes the last resort. 
and you can't find a better peaceful man than now. I promote one love. And by the time I was 18 years old, I had been shot five times trying to promote one love. And uh, uh, the vice lords and the COVID didn't take kindly of me bringing an organization from the south side to the west side and lay it down in Cape Town. And uh, yeah, they kind of shot me off the corner a couple of times, you know, and I survived. How did you guys start the Gangster Disciples? Well, let's go back before. Let me give you a little history. I met Larry when we was eight years old. We the same age. And Larry had a stuttering problem. And, you know, we was in the playground, athletic and all that old stuff. And he was my little buddy. So when he get excited, he go to studying. So here come me. I move him out the way and there I go. That's how I became an unofficial spokesman for the organization. And that used to say everybody had a voice and use it. I ain't shut up yet in over 60 years, you know? So I sometimes wonder, do we think he shouldn't have said that to me, you know? But it worked out. But uh, yeah, we started being friends at eight years old, back in 1959. Because at the time, he was living around 47th in uh, Forestville, and I'm on 51st in Federal. And the Dan Ryan and all that coming through. So they just placed us between 59th, which was a divide line, a divide out, to 74th, which was another divide out. And the borderline was from Racine to the west to like Cottage Grove at the time to the east. And that's where Daly put us. Now, the Dan Ryan supposed had started going through Bridgeport. And so that was going to displace him and his hierarchy and his homes and stuff. So this was Mayor Daly. The Mayor the first one. Yeah. So what he did, he changed from going through Bridgeport and whipped it around to our communities and displaced us, which is the norm in America. You know, and then too, as I got older, I realized the ones that was fortunate to be property owners, they cheated them. Gave them peanuts. Really nothing compared to the market, the real estate market back then. And I seen that happen again with the United Center. They displaced all their folks, took their property and promised that they was going to put them back in the community and this and that. But it replaced the Chicago Stadium. When they uh, built the new stadium, yeah. they displaced all them black folks and they took their little property didn't do nothing for them, but when you is in profits like that, and here they come with a few thousand, you know? And then they come to find out later, they got us again, you know? What would you say was the impetus to start the Gangster Disciples? Well, we was a black orientated community-based organization. We was falling behind the Black Panther, Martin Luther King, and all that, right? But the generation of us with the disciples, King David, was vying for spots in Inglewood because we were so concentrated. And we were the generation under them. So, you know, we wanted to do our own thing. Every generation wanted their own style, swag, and so forth. But they wasn't having it. But what they didn't realize, they was older than us, their parents, and they, in the 40s, migrated from the South. But we grew up in the city from kids. So we had that bond. And our thing was one for all and all for one. So when they came to, you know, call themselves going on, we got to be the same. All right, well, we were supreme gents. Because we thought we was cool and, you know, we dressing and this and that. They wasn't having that. They're going to make us. So from Supreme Gents, the way we protected ourselves in our hood, it turned to Supreme Gangsters. Now, that wasn't our name. We were Supreme Gents because we was a social club. We dancing and styling and profiling. But David, them over us... Uh, Violence was not part of the no, concept. No, never. No, I'm telling you. 
Martin Luther, Malcolm. Oh, we had that guerrilla gangster in us to survive, but we could set ourselves gentlemen gangster. We was for the community. Our center was based on the same thing with the Black Panthers and, and every other black organization. Fourth, we had our own centers and we had our own programs. We you know we fed folks and had our own teachers and, you know, we introduced a lot of, I was introduced through the Black Panther to black history. Because when I come up, if you call me black, it's just like calling, you know, saying your mama or that, that proverbial on your shoulder. And then through the civil rights movement, even the entertainers, Curtis Mayfield, James Brown, all of them, the temptation smoke here. But James Brown was the most powerful. Say it loud. I'm black and I'm proud. Stokely Carmichael, what kind of power we want? Black power. Fred Hampton. You could kill the revolutionary, but you can't kill. You kill a revolution, but you can't kill a revolution. I know I'm standing on some mighty shoulders, and that's why I want to have to be strong. Because I know the generation under me is going to stand on my shoulders and I can't be wobbly or hesitant or weak. Yeah, we got to be strong. You know, and like I say, as a teenager, I saw them start assassinating in prison all my heroes and mentors and teachers. And like I say, back going to the north side and saw them and us, how we living. I knew it wasn't right. And then when I, like I say, with the Chicago Board of Education School System, even though I started school in 1955, right behind the Board of Education, and I was supposed to have been that fair but equal, I'm still reading out of books. Run, spot, run. Dick, Ron, Jane, all this old. And then they had a book, a little black sambo. I can't stand. They had a book, a little black sambo. I'm about first, second grade. Had him in a grass skirt, red, big old lips, a bone through his nose, and they had a big old kettle pot boiling. And the story went that they didn't put no person in the pot, but they insinuated because we supposed to be cannibalism and all that. So we supposed to be eating white folks and all this stuff. And and uh, little black sambo was at the kettle, and all of a sudden the tiger come up and start chasing little black sambo around the pot. And they was running so fast, well the yellow and black line melted into margarine butter or whatever. And now. We go next page, little black symbol sitting up there with big teeth, big lips, a bone, and all this stuff grinning. That's what they was teaching me. And right today, I hate that they instill in me that Pledge of Allegiance. No, I do not pledge no allegiance to America. And in fact, I denounce my citizenship. But you know how, that's just radical, you know how they go. I still got a social security number and uh, President Biden sent me a Kool-Aid check once a month, you know? So. You did some time early. What was that for? Uh, well, they said attempt murder and guns and all that, but they was on some BS. I didn't know I had that target on my back as a kid, you know? So that's what put me on the path to the new concept and growth and development as far as gangster disciples is concerned. Because I realized when I got to, if I got 10 to 20 years for attempt murder, I come to find out that's the most under the law, the 69, 1969 law that they could have given me. So I could have went in there and told that old fat ugly ass judge to kiss my black ass. And I still would have couldn't gotten no more than 20 years, but I didn't pay these suckers. Because at the time we was under the impression you could, well, they was, you could buy your time until, you know, that great lord come out and they bust them judges and lawyers for, you know, getting payoffs and 
What did Larry get 200 years for? Well, let me tell you something about Larry. Larry is about, I ain't no sucker. So you think I'll take a back seat to a sucker? Larry is a hell of a dude, but that, that street life, he a product, we all a product of our environment. But Larry was so much so. His mother used to be a, a bartender, bar maid, or whatever, right? So when we come home from school as a kid, she'd go to work. And, and Larry, the oldest, and he had two brothers and a sister under him. And we'll go in his bedroom. We'll get the kids a nickel and dime, leave us alone. And we'll go in the bedroom. But the bedroom overlooked the guys and gals' lounge, the parking lot. So we'll sit and cut the light out and we listen to the pimp players, hustlers, and the hookers. What year is this? Oh, we was teeny. We still, before we was in eighth grade. So eight and five, we 12, 13 years old. So this is roughly what decade? It's like uh, 64, 65. So every day when his mama leave, we come up there and we go in his bedroom, cut the light out, and we'll sit there and we'll listen. And we'll listen. And then behind his house, when we're on his back porch, we're in his backyard, the York Hotel, sitting on the corner of 69th and Ashland. So while we back there, we see the pimps and the hookers taking their tricks up through the back to the hotel. So we standing down there, kicking it with them. And they call themselves, you know, well, they did, because I'm still here. So some of the things they told me, I violated as a young man because I was still, you know, young, full of folly and foolish. But it carried me right to, uh, you know, to the day. So naturally, with the Black Potation movies, the introduction of drugs into the community, and them down or gone movies, horse on Black Pimp and all this garbage, we impressive. And they knew that it was designed for us to fail. Because Jagger Hoover has said the biggest threat to America and America's way of life is the unification of the black man. And you see, from the boat back then to right today, it's still working. We can't figure out a way to unite. They don't want us to unite. No, I don't know in my lifetime, but that's my goal in life. I have. Two, I want to see us united, not just my growth and development, but all young brothers and sisters, unite. And that's that, that giant we've been trying to wake for you the last 40, 50 years, because we know how powerful that is. And once we wake that giant, we're going to be a power to be reckoned with. What do you think society needs, or what do you think the black community needs to do that? I don't want to say help. I want to say leave us alone. Leave us alone through history. You saw the progress we made with nothing. We always make something out of nothing. Y'all, I ain't gonna say y'all personally, but they gave us the garbage to eat. And you see now, worldwide, they love soul food. But it was chitlins. What the, the, I can't even spell that shit, let alone smell it. Guts, hog balls, some pig balls, greens, all this mess. But we now best food in the world. Best food in the world. Yeah. What do you think the black community needs to, to rise up? Leave us alone. Through history, we the only race in America that they bombed us from the fucking air. They drop bombs on us. And look, Wall Street, the rest of them, how to, every time we take a step or two forward, here they come. They burn us out. They murder us and run us off. Like with my father, and he's not the only one. When he came back for World War I with the double peace, peace for victory abroad, peace for victory here. Texas, when you re-entering, he still had his uniform on, proud, we didn't want and stuff. He went into the uh, cab station. 
And uh, first white person told him, he in uniform, we just won. First person he saw, his counterpart told him, the niggas' interest is in the back. Me and Larry had to register in 1969, we turned 18 because they had to draft. The Vietnam War was going on. No way. And then Muhammad Ali had already told them, ain't no brown skinned people on this side of the world ever call them nigga. They're not his enemy. Y'all are. Why am I going to go around the world and kill brown, poor, brown people for the y'all agenda? And you know, wherever they go, they bring disease, destruction, and everything else with them. And every other race that I ever studied was peace-loving people. And as far as my black race, if we was what they tried to say we were, it wouldn't be no white people on earth. The bombs that you referred to that they dropped? In Philadelphia. And they had a black male Oh, good. They dropped it on this organization. That everybody had the last name Africa. And uh, they wanted them out in Philadelphia. They wanted them out. And they resisted. And they had kids. They had kids in the building. They bombed them. And then when they, they, tried, they tried to send the women and the kids out, and they were shooting at them. Some of them, you know, survived. And then the sister... Africa that survived, they gave her 20 years or some old dumb stuff, you know? Yeah. Yeah. What the black race need from day one, even before they bought us here, leave us alone. They just, you know, like I tell my family, my sons and grandkids, they here so we have to learn how to coexist. Be honorable, respectable, do your job, you know, do it. Like my daddy just said, you're just a sweet sweeper. Be the best sweep, sweeper in the world. But then how can you be the great street sweeper where every time you clean up out of spite and hatred, a person come along in front of you and throw some shit on the ground in front of you. And they act like they dare you not to clean it up. But you got to clean it up because you have a family. You clean it up because they say you're a boy, but you know you're a man. You know, and as far as being human, do you realize how we have to suppress human emotions just to get by? It's sad. And going back to the organization, yeah. Uh, before we were Supreme Gangsters, at 11 years old, when we met Didi, he was a, a cobra from the projects. And uh, he was a couple years old than us, but he was very impressive because he had to process as a teenager, tailor-made clothes, jewelry. And Larry was uh, very impressive with that type of life. You know, like I say, I know how many hours we spent together and others looking out their bedroom window but how many hours when we weren't there, he was still looking and learning. And uh, he got caught up? Yeah, we all did. You know, and uh, I often wonder, just think if that window was the parking lot to some higher education. You know, just think. If that window, that parking lot was the parking lot of a college, even a high school, who knows? Who knows? You know, just like Larry, he went to the ninth grade in uh, the Chicago public school system. And the uh, first day of school, he got shot in the ass by a high smith on Little Long Street, some disciples, you know? And uh, that was the end of his public school education. But he's college degree today on the growth and development, you know? But his 200 years was for murder, I assume? Yeah, conspiracy. Uh, Didi, his rapper, was convicted of being an actual shooter. But 
some of the folks testified, especially Larry Leveston. We were childhood friends, testified that Larry, that's all he needed. One to testify said Larry gave the orders. And he wound, him and Didi wound up with two hundred years. But we should have seen the writing on the wall because Didi made parole. And he was the shooter, yeah, Didi, but Didi had that gift for the gab and, you know, a little, yeah. So he made parole. And uh, under the new concept, Larry's still sitting there with these 200 years and we done made that change from the old to the new, okay? And we done got organized, we done got legit and blah, blah, we spit it. I made parole, well, I introduced the world to the new concept October 1981. I appointed Larry the chairman. Well, quite naturally, I'm appointing myself the co-chairman. And I put the first board of uh, directors, board members together and induced, you know, the 16 laws, the concepts, that type do this, prefer all that old mess. And uh, after a while, it was working. Like I said, I went home in uh, January of 1982. So D. Robertus was the director of Illinois State Penitentiary and me and him was cool. So for six months, he would allow me to come in and, uh, you know, visit that when I, if I wanted to. But then after he went from the director of the penitentiary, Governor Thompson had moved him to be the director of the tollway. So I guess it was his time, you know, to steal, you know, and I lost, I've never been back into another penitentiary institution. They won't allow me. I can't correspond. I can't get phone calls and stuff from Larry or nobody. And uh, he never been convicted of actually physically killing nobody. But they gave him 200 years. And uh, under the new concept in the 80s, during the programs we put together and on the streets in and out, we stopped all that raping, we stopped all that stabbing, all that violence against the police and blah, blah, we spit it. And it came down to the wardens, them in the Illinois State Penitentiary, they said, okay, cool, do what you have to do, but don't escape. But, we gangsters, you know, someone with life sentences made escape or two, you know, but, uh, yeah. Did the basic idea behind the Gangster Disciples get off track over the years? Yeah. Which, like I say, I went home in uh, January, and I've been whispering in Larry Eels since we was kids. Now we don't have that. After six months, I got off parole. I organized growth and development, introduced a new concept to the streets, but after six months, I'm off parole. I got married July 29th, got off parole July 28th. And I headed for California August the 1st. I had to go to school because one of my main six points was education. And here it is, I got an eighth grade education. Larry got a ninth grade. So even though we were self-taught, I still had to go to school because we lead by example. How can I make a law to say if you're 21 or under without a GED or high school diploma, it's mandatory for you to go to school. Now we'll take all your basic needs, you know, nice clothes, gym shoes for visits, and we smoke, we take care of that, you get high, or we will take, you know, we, we took, just go to school. And one thing I'm proud of under the lit classes where well, mandatory is that 20, 30 years later, brothers come and introduce me to their family. And they say, well, I want you to meet Ike. This fellow I was telling you about, I was a teenager when I went into the system, and you know, you didn't heard about the candy bar on the bed, and you know, I'm all that. And he said, didn't have to worry about that. He just concentrated on school. And so many of them, even up to masters today, didn't realize that they could be taught and educated because of miseducation. They didn't want us. They wanted us to just have a strong body and a weak mind. We made that transition. Now we got a strong mind and a strong body. And they still are trying to knock us for that. We just want to be left alone. We don't, that integration and all that, just leave us alone. Cause through history you see, they talking about 
the boot, you know, grab your bootstrap. We ain't had no damn boots. How in the hell we gonna grab or come up with that? Man, please, we ain't even had no boots. But we made a way out of no way. We made something out of nothing we always have. And then right today, I'm still learning and growing. And through the mass communication, new in real time and this and that and all over the world, majority of the stuff in this room, you know who invented that? Yeah. But I keep telling these young brothers and sisters, do you think a big old fat redneck gonna sit up on his porch and worry himself on trying to make them brothers and sisters that's in their cotton field work a little easier? They load a little light? No. But because they said we was property. So every dream thought that I have, every word I see out of my mouth, anything I do, they own it. So you think they're going to give me credit even for the simple street light we invented, the stop light? You know, they couldn't. This technology with the iPhones, e-phones, with all that mess, it come from a black man. When they were talking about going to the moon and stuff, them sisters was the one that put that together where they was able to act like they've been to the moon. I ain't sure about that shit. But I know they want to find another planet that could sustain life like on Earth. But we going because they need us. So a few of us going to go, I don't know if I'm going to make the cut. But I know a few good young brothers and sisters, they going because they need us. And that's it, but they still want to control us. And it's the same way. No, them people ain't set on no damn porch sipping no mint juleps and got a brother fan in them in the summer. Mississippi hot summer, and he's sitting up there worried about old Joe or Willie George in the field somewhere under that hot ass sun picking cotton. He gonna make the, his load easier. But Willie George and Bobo and Jojo them come out of, come up with an idea or invention to make their work load. And when they induced it to this big old lazy son of a gun, he, he took it. That was his. We property. We don't own nothing. And can you imagine your mother and father love each other? They're humans. They love each other. We had them emotions. And I'm your master. I like your wife, your girl. Hey, Sambo, go get her. And you laying next to her, what can you do? You got to watch your woman. Walk out that door in the middle of the night and you know that man gonna do some perverted shit to her. Cause the white women weren't gonna let them do that to them. Can you imagine what that brother had to go through? And that sister, can you imagine when she came back to hurt and shame? Can you imagine? I'm your master. I called your kid one day, and I just sold him off to some place you don't know where or when. We human. Can you imagine what that do to a person? But they say we animals, we diabolical, we this and that, we devils. Where we learn it from? We peace loving people, because like I say, the pilgrims. When they first came here and experienced that first winter, the Indians and the blacks should have let their ass die. They shouldn't have showed them how to survive a winter, how to eat through the winter. And you see what they did. We just want to be left alone. You know, we had civilization, we had kings and queens, we had everything until they came. You know, I'm uh, naturally I'm pro-black, but I know a man's heart. And we wouldn't be where we are now without that aid and assistance. One of them, I had the Pontiac case in 1978 for the Pontiac riot. And uh, this is the riot in the uh, Pontiac, Illinois. Yeah, back in 19, July 22nd, 1978, when them three officers got killed, and three got messed up, and the police got burned down. And they all uh, gave me and Larry. The conspiracy, they admit, they know we ain't touching nobody, we ain't burnt nothing, but they say it couldn't have happened without organizing it and I say so. 
So they gave us a conspiracy. They figured they could get us that way. If if any of the other brothers got convicted under the conspiracy law, they was gonna convict us. And by we already convicted felons, that was automatically a light sentence or a death sentence. But Governor Thompson and his cronies is like Trump, privilege. They just knew. But they underestimated us. They had us listed as functioning literates. And we went along with it, but we knew better. That's why we beat that case. And me and Larry, we could not only beat it for ourselves with the conspiracy. That means we had to beat it for other uh, 14 brothers. They was guilty or not. And I knew if we had got convicted, they was going to put us in a hole somewhere for years. Or what, what were the conditions in that prison when that happened? Deplorable. Anytime you have two brothers within the week hang themselves, something ain't right. You need to make a change. And quite naturally, they knew the way the conditions were. They knew you could only just push your brother so far. They knew he was going to rebel against it. So what they did, they went and got Pinckney, a black man that retired from the army and made him the warden. They knew it was going to happen, but they didn't care. It was about the money. All the educational programs was gone. The law said, and we supposed to have single cells. We supposed to have access to a law library. None of that. My first demonstration and work and stop and, and food strike was because we didn't have a law library. My, my first shut this shit down. And then they finally conceded, gave us a law library, which was a bloom closet from the TV college with some old antique book shit with a couple of shelves, but we kept pushing. And right today in Pontiac, there's a brand new building in the high school that uh, have a 21st century law library. I'm proud of that. And I'm uh, like this year, 2023 was the best year on the growth and development. We had more folks graduating than ever before. Ever before, and that's our first law is education. When I was, uh, like I said, when I was 17, 18, with Malcolm X College with Dr. Hurst, I started the GED program for the street organization. It didn't last long because it was positive, so, you know, they didn't fund it no more. And so that's when uh, we started our own lit classes. I have met I don't, I don't, really don't want to mention them people because they used us. Every politician, every prominent Rem Leroy's, like the temptation said, still in the name of the Lord. And uh, yeah, I met a bunch of them, Stokely, H. Ralph Brown, Bobby Seals, everybody back in the 60s and 70s. I, I met them, and met with them. I had, like I said, it was my mentors and heroes. I met them through the Godfield organization, which was a, a community organization on the west side of Chicago. And during the Martin Luther King riots, Doug Andrews, which was the president, and uh, Curly Reed, and Tall, his last name was Brown, but he was a tall brother, we used to call him Tall, but his last name was Brown. They was indicted for inciting the riot. Now, y'all just killed Martin Luther King Jr. Now you're going to take our leaders from the West Side and charge them with a conspiracy for burning the West Side down. But Sammy Davis Jr., a bunch of, uh, Oscar, uh, Brown, bunch of prominent entertainers and lawyers and this and that came to him. And Sammy Davis Jr. put up over $500,000 for their bond. You hung out mostly on the West Side of Chicago or the South Side? I'm from uh, Inglewood. You're from the South Side. Yes, I'm from I'm from Chicago. But when I was 16 years old in Sheridan, and uh, at the time the welfare department had it, and they could keep you to you was 21. So by me coming from the South Side and we fighting disciples and the Blackstone Rangers and anything else, because we that new generation and they wanted us. So. My parole, in order for me to get a parole, I was trying to get an out-of-state parole to Detroit. But my cousin found in the street like killed somebody. So that killed me going there. 
So they said by me never living on the west side of Chicago, blah, blah, this, if my family would move from the south side to the west side, I could get parole before, you know, uh, uh, at the time, like I said, you commission kept you to use 21. So they made that sacrifice and moved to the west side. Never, never been over there. But I knew the brothers from the juvenile system all the way through school because they sent me to a dismembered school, Mosley, you know, for bad boys. But I never was bad. I was just inquisitive, you know. And uh, what they say, this stuff, ADHC or some old sh You know, how are you going to tell me? One plus one is two. Okay, cool. I figured that shit out in five minutes, but the rest of them got 20 more minutes. How am I going to sit there and be quiet? Ain't going to happen, so I'm a bad boy now. They even put me, they didn't have a yellow school bus, though. I probably would have been on that. But they had me in the, in the basement, in the boiler room, with the mentally challenged and, you know, and uh, if one had to go to the bathroom, we all had to go holding hands and all this mess. And uh, believe it or not, I had a teacher, you know, you hear about teachers, you know, ask you, you know, what you want to do when you grow up. And there's, oh, I'm going to be a police and fireman, I mean, you know, typical stuff. So I don't know what I told her, but that little fat, ugly ass lady told me, don't put my sights on that. In other words, you can, you know, look at, you can be a janitor, you know, that type of stuff. Yeah. Chicago's South Side and West Sides are very violent. The violence? Lots of crime, lots of violence. People are getting killed every week. Trying to survive. Nothing, trying to get something from nothing. That's what it is. Where's the youth centers? Remember, we had YMCAs and all that. Archie Moore Boxing Club, you know, we had field houses and in in, 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 they cut all that out. All the money is going to wars. Ain't no more community program. Just like now in K-Town, because of that TIF money, they talking about what they going to build over there. I've been to two meetings and the same shit they saying was the same shit we heard in 69. And it still got vacant lots. The promises was empty promises, just like them vacant lots. And the same thing, now they're ready to bring this TIF money on, they're sitting up there talking about what they're going to build here, what they're going to do here. Excuse me, sir, what about the youth? Ain't nobody mentioned no youth programs. Ain't nobody act mentioned nothing about no after-school programs. They didn't took even, you know, basketball. It's a black man sport. How can you take the rims out of the playgrounds and the parks in our community? Now you got brothers shooting basketball in a little milk crate. That's why they're so deadly. But you notice too, with the NBA, the sports period, the blacks, majority of them come from different countries. A black man in America to get in sports, you gotta be exceptional good now. Because they didn't open it up to, to the world. Football, you could be like the MVP. You know, he ain't even American. He come from some other place. But that's what they do, just like with Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier them in the 60s, 70s, they try to look for a great white hope. And now if you notice how it then changed in sports, if you got to be light-skinned or mixed, not from an inner city, because they say we violent and this and that. And you notice Curry, Tatum, all them is mixed. And they've been diluting our blood since the 60s. In the 60s, they introduced all these brothers to these different white girls and Asians and this and that. So they marry them, have babies. So the wealth that they accumulated, it don't come back to us when she leave them or kill them. The money go to them, to that side of the family. Look at Michael Jordan. He left Juanita, his childhood sweetheart mother, his kids for some foreigner now. So look at Tiger Woods. I don't like Kanye. I don't like Common. We protected them in the city. What did they do? Kanye still ass took his money to them Kardashians. Where the youth centers? I thought when they raid, I thought when them folks' uh, mother died, 
oh, that was a good opportunity to put a youth center name in after them, especially their mothers was educators. <laughs> and just think, we could have just the money that they make, we could have youth centers for the kids in every major city, really in every neighborhood. You know, because you see, the government, the power to be not going to do it. They don't care. Well, Michael J. said, they don't care about us. And they try to contain it. Just like when them young brothers and sisters start hitting them stores on the Magnificent Mile and going up north, carjacking and all that. Now, they ain't laughing at us. Because it's everywhere. And what you think? It's just going to fit so many of them in the ghetto or a room with no air conditioning, so we gonna branch out, like I did. I even got to the point, by the time I was 13, I broke in my father's boss house. I didn't make it all the way through, cause he had that old stew pigeon ass dog making noise. But they didn't bust me at the house, but me buying a black man off Buckingham and uh, Marine Drive, and the sun going down, I'm the only little black dude out there, so quite naturally, I was the one trying to break in these people's house. Yes, it was me, and no matter what, them two detectives, they tried every trick in the book to make me confess. You go on night, we do this, we do that. But they didn't know my dad, Big Ike, was sitting outside. Ain't no jail. It's worse than had to confront that man, and I didn't try to break in this man's house. You think I'm going to confess? And as a kid, that's my first law, when I wrote the laws for the organization, Silence and Secrecy. Violence and secrecy, and it works. That's why I'm sitting here doing this with you now. And we all have secrets at the heart. And I got a fucking graveyard in mine. You know, not only just the secrets, all the brothers and sisters out of the laws, not just natural by the hands of the law and uh, the state representatives. It's just like now we're trying to put a little pressure on the government and the uh, Department of Corrections. You know, we got C numbers in Illinois just alone from the 70s. They're still doing time. The brother's 50, 60, 70 years old. What good is you housing them in a penitentiary? Oh, that's right. Businessmen own penitentiaries, got stock in penitentiaries. And a businessman in the business to do what? Make fucking money, right? How can I make money with the penitentiaries empty? Oh, change the sentencing laws that the, our counterparts profit from. In fact, like I said, I was sentenced under 1960 law, and thank God they couldn't give me no more than 20 years under their law. But here come Larry, 200 years. Get the f and, and you saw the numbers they've been giving out. You done met a bunch of brothers and sisters do what you do. They've been in there 20, 30, 40 years. All that old crazy mess. But, because businessmen have stock and influence. Can you imagine the money I got if I just had a contract to sell soap? And then, too, back in the 80s when they were doing that Farm 80 with foreclosing all them farms and all this and that. And them hillbillies came together, had them concerts, raising money and this and that, bailed them out. You know, we still waiting on the... Uh... It ain't coming. Ain't nobody going to bail us out. But just leave us alone. I mean, but you see the, the lack of good role models in the, in the inner cities? Yeah, well, our role models... You see like lack this. of education? Yeah. How are we going to fix that? It's just like... I go to the schools, you mean to tell me it's not enough intelligent black men and women to be teachers, to teach our own? And I'm, you're teaching me some shit about little black sambo? And then in the 1954, Brown versus Board of Education, they said it's supposed to be segregated but equal but fair, right? Never. Never was fair. It ain't fair today. And then just, just like the moves we made during the civil rights movement, they didn't took them back, you know, affirmative action. 
You know, they didn't bark you saying, hold up, I'm white and I'm qualified to go to school, but you letting this brother in and we the same. But he get in because of affirmative action. Now, I'm being discriminated against. So when the 60s politician that was with the civil rights, Johnson and all of them, then died off, you see what happened to affirmative action. It's gone. And we don't need it now, but it's the same way I always say, sir. If me and my counterparts start at the same line, on the same condition, I'm going to smoke his ass every time. And I know that. But you think they're going to play fair? No. No, the stack is, all, dick is already stacked against me. See, and we just can't be good. We got to be better. You know, I can't just... uh go in there and say I'm a basketball player and a pro. I can shoot free throws, I can do a layup, I can do a jump shot, but now induction of uh, Dr. J with that shot fading out of bound and he did, I said, oh Lord, did here come Michael Jackson? Oh Lord, they playing the board the rim now. But Muggs and Spud Wells gave us under six feet a little hope, you know, and uh, they made it to the NBA, made it to the Hall of Fame, and they inspired a lot of young brothers and sisters, you know? But like I said, we just can't be mediocre or good. And uh, even though I know I could beat him at the starting line, I'm going to lose. I I'm really going to lose. And you see what they done done, like I said, to all our mentors, my heroes and stuff when I was growing up. And like Martin, how can you do that man like that and he promoting love and peace? And no matter what you did to him, you always turned the other cheek. But Malcolm said, fuck that. I mean, we ain't got it with two of these motherfuckers. I already been turning them all my life. And you see what they did to him. And then it's sad, they put that on them brothers for killing and assassinating Malcolm. 40 years later, they admit that they didn't do it, give him a few thousand dollars and kick their ass right back out in the streets. Just like with, 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 with uh, my childhood buddy, Emmett Till. That's why I could never go to Mississippi, even though my family's from there. We could never go back to Mississippi because what they did to Emmett Till's, and we was born in the city, so we don't know nothing about move over. I'm like, man, can you imagine I'm in some shit and they t t white person coming down and I got to get off the sidewalk or take, man. See, we didn't know nothing about that. We didn't come up with it, so they couldn't, uh, after Emmett Till, we couldn't go back down south. But what kind of person could do that to a kid? And then on her dying bed, she admitted she was there when they took Emmett Till out his uh, grandfather's house, and she was there when, he, when they did that stuff to him. And just like this uh, black FBI agent, he knew what the FBI did and was part of killing Malcolm. But they had threatened him and his family if he said anything, but on his deathbed, he told the truth of what they uh, plotted to kill. You know, the FBI had a hand in killing Malcolm X. You know, and it's the same way how they did us with the syphilis and all that. After that generation died off, the next generation, to, to sure they get a career, make a move, they exposed that stuff. It was like crack cocaine in the uh, oh my god eighties. Well, compared to crack cocaine to what they doing now with this fentanyl, no comparison. You know, the crack was kind of targeted towards the black community. It's everything. You know, the white folks even admit it. Sell this shit in a dark community, and these supposed to be the Italian gangsters and shit. And they said, sell it to the doctor, but they never expected they kids was gonna get a hold of that shit. Just like I'm from K-Town, and uh, they named our expressway, I said our expressway, the Heron Highway, because it sit right there next to the Ice and our expressway in all the suburbs. And so who you think, we ain't got no money, where you think these pimp players and hustlers getting all this money from? And, and, and the same way, the, 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 the prostitutes, crack became they pimp. 
no more pimps. But they still doing their thing because the perverts be coming from the suburbs with them dollars. So you know whatever it take to get them dollars, they gonna do that perverted stuff because they know they can't go home in the suburbs and do that to their girlfriends and wives and all that other stuff. And uh, we all freaks, you know, we young men and shit. Yeah, we all freaks and shit. But some of us is just a little freakier. And on the borderline of some illegal pedophile and all that type of mess. What do you uh, see for the future of the black community in America? Oh, it's going to take a minute, but we're going to overcome. You know, they're going to uh, look up one day and realize, just leave them alone. You know, like I say, all of uh, my counterparts have a heart because if they didn't, we wouldn't be where we're at today. The same way with the Pontiac case. That's why Larry took off from Black Gangster Disciple Nation to GD, and he said nothing ever before the G and nothing after the D because he knew it took all nationalities, all people from all walks of life, in the private sector, legal section, and everything to ensure that we had a fair shake on that Pontiac case. And uh, everybody, all nationalities and races came and was part of our Pontiac Brothers Support Coalition, Defense Fund, Steering Committee, and all that. And uh, here I sit today because of them. Yeah, so it ain't no, uh, we open the organization up to all races. And uh, some of my brothers and sisters are going to like this, even to the gays. And y'all just like football, basketball players that's coming out that's gay. Yeah, we got gay board members. It ain't about your sexuality. It's about your men mentality. And I'd rather have some of my gay brothers and sisters than some of you with muscles. Some of you popping iron, but do crossword puzzles. Play dominoes, some exercise your mind. That's a fucking muscle. You know, I had a problem trying to put the laws together about the exercise program. But yeah, they say, yeah, yeah. Oh, you silly motherfuckers. Yeah, you need the exercise because if you got a strong body, you're going to have a what? Strong mind. And it works. You know, I've been ridiculed. I've been called all type of lies, punks, bitches, and all that shit since I done made myself public to this Facebook. But on the reason I made myself public, because I had been living amongst the shadows and I was cool. I had retired from the organization when I was 40 years old. And when I wrote the laws, I put a law stated at 35, you could retire in good standing. And then I put it free enterprise because I knew I was gonna have business and get money and I ain't want no motherfucker come knocking on my door talking about cut me in and cut it out of what I owe the organization. If anything, the organization owed me, and I'm gonna say this now, me and Larry ain't never traded money. Drugs, clothes, none of that. I always had my own. And he had his own. Same way he had his organization, Scream Gangsta Gangsta Saves on the south side, I had my organization on the west and north side. Same way we came there and we had the alliance. Even though we was as one, the disciples still did their thing and the gangsters still did their thing until it was you know, time to come together on some political or business or some community affair. Yeah, but uh, I've always been the man behind the man. I'm comfortable with that because I'm ensuring my ability and um, what I do and what I know. Plus, I had a mother and father in the household and 16 kids, so by the time I was like 9, 10, it had to be about six, seven of us in the house, and that would took me uh, to the streets too, because I have nine sisters and all of them stool pigeons, you know? So I'd be doing stuff to eat and tell my mama and father. So I had to keep going farther and farther away from home. And um, I grew up in the Disciples neighborhood, the Royal Disciples on 66th and Sangamon. And the headquarters and center was on 64th and Sangamon. And I went to school with them and come up with them. But because of uh, my nine sisters, family first, you know, you can't go with my sister because 
I mean, you can grow with her, but I just don't fuck with you because of family first. And we don't play putting no hands on nobody. And I thank God all nine of my sisters wasn't the type of women because I'm their brother. But you, yeah, I tell Ike, no, you don't tell Ike shit. Because if you call me one time, if I come and I holler at this sucker, and that night or a day or two, you back with him, don't ever call me no more. You and that sucker just, I hope y'all have a long, healthy, and a happy life. But don't call even though you my sister, but you know I'm still the family first. But I thank God that I never had no problems with the different organizations in the streets when it came to my uh, family, because at a young age, I let it be known. Don't fuck with my family. What, 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 what is it that attracts a young man to being in a gang? Family. It's a new family? Family. For a kid that comes from a broken home? You know, that's why in the, early, in the early days, the organization was family. You know, because blood don't make family. You know, you might start off as family, but... Uh, if more black men stuck around and raised their, their children? Well, see, we did. Until the 60s, when they start with this welfare stuff. And they start, in order for you to get welfare, you have to name somebody as the daddy. Now they gonna make him a criminal. He's scared to go to work cause he's making minimum wage. Now they gonna take that little shit from him. He's still trying to maintain. And the most embarrassing thing I've seen my father done, these people, welfare people, cause they was bringing peanut butter and powdered milk and all that stuff. And somebody said these people was coming and I seen my daddy, a man, get up, they're trying to hide that little ragged ass radio. They're trying to hide an old broken ass toaster because we don't supposed to have that stuff. And here come these people going to go through your house to see if you get this and that. And you don't supposed to be no man there. Because if it was a man there, they was going to cut off that peanut butter and powdered milk stuff. And we was depending on that. Yeah, they've been doing us from day one. You know, just like me and you, this is the first time we ever met, if time we ever talked. But we cool. Because when I meet a person, I don't care who they are, you get 100 points. Now, you could add or lose points, but I'm not going to let you get past 70. Because if you lose 30 fucking points, that means we're going to wind up trying to kill each other in a minute. So it's best for me. That's it. I always have a point system. Like me and you, we got 100 points so far. You still got 100. You know, I started to drop one of your points yesterday when we was talking on the phone when you said what gang I was in. And uh, you corrected me. Yeah. Oh, no, I didn't correct. I checked you earlier because I'm 72. I'll be 73 in November. I ain't never been in no gang. What, what are the gang's disciples? That's not well, that's not no gang until Jagger Hoover said we was a gang. And that just opened the door because the Black Pants and my mouths, the uh, SLA, all them different, you know, black organizations was on the move. What did you call it? An organization? Yeah, I'm on, I think part of an organization all my life. Yeah, never a gang. Never a gang. No, they said Hoover and, uh, you know, Nixon back in the CC was a gang. And then that's why I don't go with titles, with nicknames and all that dog and bear and killer gorilla and all that shit because they try to live up to that. In fact, I did a thesis when I was in college on nicknames. And that's why I'm just like, I've been called bird and Spike and all type of kings and oh, I'm an elder now they say, but I prefer just Ike, you know, like Larry. I'm just it, Ike T. I'm just it. He called me it when he don't like me. Yes, yeah, that old it nigga. Yeah, Larry, I right. fuck it. I'm that it nigga. Yeah, I've been it a long time. I just hate the way uh, I hate the way they did that man. And just think, the best education we ever had was in the penitentiary. And I do my best thinking in a jail cell or hospital bed. And believe me, I spent time in both of them. And uh, like I said, my best education was in the penitentiary, even though I had to do three years on death row and, oh Lord, you know? And like people be saying, why y'all? Get together, I'll be talking about them penitentiary days because that's our life. Them brothers, I did 10 years, brothers then 20, 30, 40 years. What else are we going to talk about when we get together? The stock market, 
you know, uh, or what's that shit? Housewives of Atlanta or Hollywood or some of them. Man, please, you know? Yeah, but back to this organization, because I want to say that to my brothers and sisters, you know? Yeah, we started off as a community-based organization. And by the 60s, the introduction of drugs and that black protection, Donald Jones, all that mess, we took out off the pride. But it's still nation time. We can still do this. We could still wake that giant up. Y'all don't realize you that giant. Look what we did for Harold Washington, Carol Most Obama, even Obama. Only election that man ever lost was when he went against Reynolds, the Black Panther, because he one of us. Only election they ever lost. And why do you think Jesse Jackson, Obama's them come to Chicago to get off their political agenda and their career? Because they know we'll make it happen. We made it happen. We were the first black politicians in the United States. But they tricked them. They tricked us. They tricked us. Built more penitentiaries instead of schools. And speaking of schools, it's just like now with the Ukraines, another ethnic group. In order to get to the schools that they closed in our communities and the senior citizen building, they opened them up for them. Rent cards, the rent paid, the stipend for clothes and all this shit. And in order for them to get there in our community, they had to go past homeless people, homeless camps. And then, too, even the Mexicans, they're letting them in illegally or whatever because they're getting paid off them because they cartel money. Y'all know it ain't just in my community, your communities all over the United States. With that cartel money, you see they been building and rehabbing all these old buildings and that that our grandparents, great grandparents used to own. They done fenced up all their property, the vacant lots around them. They got new cars and all this shit. All of a sudden, where do you get that from? Oh, okay, that's that cartel money. And we was the biggest consumers for 40 fucking years. How can I be mad at them? I'm not mad at them. Just like in the 80s when uh, Harold Washington was running for office, that's when uh, the Latino political organization came in and system, Guterres and all them. And uh, we uplifted them, let them ride on our coattail, this and that. You think they mess with us now? No. No, the last 20 years, you ain't seen no Latino organization hook up with a black organization. But we, like the rest of them, Jesse Jackson and all of them, uh, Brazier, Fry, I could go on forever. They was cool with us when they first got here. You know? Oh, they loved us because we was the army. We was the latest arms. We was the introduction to the community. But soon as they got a foothold and got a few grants or whatever and got a few, uh, uh, not, I ain't going to say the upper middle class, but compared to where we was at, we considered them a little upper middle class. All of a sudden, we gangbangers and shit again. Fuck you. All my life, they used us. But I'm not mad at them because how they living now, the position they have, we put them there. But you think I could go somewhere and tell Jackson kids and shit I need some money to to pay off rent, not no mortgage, just a, they don't fuck with me. They know my name, they know my background, but I'm a gangbanger when they get to a certain level. Yeah, they've been using us, but uh, I'm still proud because they're in a the position. We made first mayors. Carol Mosley Brown first, Obama. And uh, speaking of Obama, you a bitch. Excuse me, he ain't the president anymore. Is oh, that's right, he's a citizen. Yeah, because what we done for you, you could have, you gave us the impression you was gonna help us. You didn't help us, you hurted us. You had like Trump and the rest of them before them. When they get in, two minutes before they get out of the election, what they do? They pardon all their cronies and their buddies and stuff. You had an opportunity, man. You supposed to be from Chicago. We did what we had to do to put you in that position. 
And then you had a chance to help Larry, to help us. Yeah, you like the rest of them. Said I was gonna be nice, but some shit, like my mama said, some motherfuckers just make you curse. Um, you could edit, you know. <laughs> I might. You know, you could do what you had to do. I'm sorry, but uh, before we get back to my uh, the organization, yeah, I'm a uh, co-founder of the Black Supreme Gangsters. I'm co-founder of Black Gangster Disciples. I'm a co-founder of Gangster Disciples. I'm a original Pontiac brother. And uh, proud of my work, I'm a co-chairman, a retired co-chairman of Growth and Development, but I am the historian. And uh, it does my heart good, like I say, when a young brother and sister come tell me because of you or the organization, that's where I'm at today. Only thing I hate is that we've been around over 50 years, so that means we got brothers in their 70s and 80s that are still alive, and we got brothers and sisters still working. We do when you go through just your daily life in a day, you might not realize it, but you be in contact with brothers and sisters from the organization. But because of the stigma of what we're supposed to be, they can't come out and say because of this or that or because of growth development, I'm this and that. And I wish y'all would, especially the ones that's retired. I understand your position in your community, your jobs, or your church, and this and that. But them young brothers need to know, them young sisters need to know your testimony, where you come from, where your growth, and what it took you. Oh, one more thing on the 21st century vote. You know this 2024 election is very important to us. We need y'all to register to vote and participate in the political organization, man. We need that. Larry wouldn't be, and countless and faces of others wouldn't be political prisoners because we would have had folks in office that could have made a change, change them unjustly in illegal laws. All right. We good? I right, thank you very much. Thank you. Very interesting talk. We're not finished. I'm going to come back. You know that. <laughs>